Alrighty, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. First of all, thank you for being here. Um, especially, I mean, well, some of you have to be here as part of your mandatory in-person DEI training. Um, but first and foremost, I wanted to introduce our speaker for today. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Dr. Jordan got his, um, got his BA actually here at Cornell. He studied government and anthropology um, in 1988 and then... 1350. In 1350. Um, we have a fossil in our presence. Um, and then he went on to get his PhD at Columbia, also in anthropology, and we are so lucky to have him here today to talk to us about the history of the land uh, that we do Odyssey, as well as many other fun activities on, um, and we are going to discuss a lot of the cultural ramifications of that. Without further ado, I would, let's thank Dr. Jordan for his time. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really glad to be here tonight. I only see a couple people that I recognize, you two, uh, from uh, the class I'm teaching uh, right now, um, which is on the long-term indigenous history of this region. But um, I also think that you shouldn't tell people about the QR code thing, because I thought, you know, I was like, oh, everyone's taking my picture. This is, I, felt, I felt really like influential and important in a different way. And so I think you should have let me continue with, uh, with thinking that that was what was happening. So, uh, good afternoon, outdoors people. Um, I think uh, I, I, I was really interested in uh, to get uh, the request to speak here uh, and because I think it's really important for those of you who are out in, uh, you know, really anywhere, but especially those of you who are out in kind of out of the way places, to sort of think about all the people that came before you and uh, in some cases, I think probably uh, are, are responsible for some of the landscape features and maybe even some of the trails uh, that, that uh, you'll be using on your various, uh, on your various different journeys. So uh, I've got a lot to say and not a ton of time to say it, so I was trying to figure out how uh, to limit, what, what, you know, to hone in on what was important and I couldn't do it, so I have way too much material. So I'm gonna skip around a lot, uh, but, but uh, hopefully we'll hit get a few things that will be uh, useful to, uh, to know about or to think about. So I'm gonna start with the university's land acknowledgement. Um, Cornell University's Ithaca campus is located on the traditional homelands of the Gaikono, the Cayuga Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which is an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. So um, I'm sure that you've all seen that or heard it in many different instances, and I'm going to try and flesh out some of those connections that, uh, that you know, from the very distant past. Uh, but I want to really uh, emphasize above all else that this is a living connection. Contemporary indigenous people, contemporary Gaikono people have a very special tie to this land. They see it as being their traditional homelands. Their ancestors are buried here uh, and they want very much for the people that are, have occupied this territory and it actually forced them into exile for almost 200 years to take care of the land. Uh, uh, to make sure that it's health, that the lands and waters are healthy for the people that are uh, for the the generations to come, uh, seventh generation uh, and beyond. And so, uh, I'm the director of the American Indian and Indigenous Studies program. I'm not indigenous myself. I actually grew up in this uh, in this area, so this land is important to me as well. And I'm going to give you, even though many of your trips are going to be going into the traditional territories of other nations, I'm going to talk about that some, but I'm going to give you a strong dose of, uh, you know, of sort of the, the specifics of the Cuba Lake Basin, uh, just because you're going to be spending, uh, you know, a fair amount of time here, and I think this is something that every Cornell student should know, and a lot of the Odyssey trips also do go through uh, Gaia Cornell territory. So I'm going to do a little bit of pronunciation uh, for you. Uh, um, those of you who are in my class have an edge here, but I want to make sure that you uh, are able to say these or at least give it a shot. So I'm going to have everybody uh, say these words. Um, and they don't look like 
uh, they, they appear uh, in print, okay? So there are certain things, like you might look at the first word and say, think that it's gaio go hono, but that underline under the vowel means that it's, uh, that it's silenced or whispered, so it's actually gaio kono. So go ahead and say that. Gaio kono. All right, that's pretty good. Okay, and then, so the gaio kono are a member of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy of Six Nations. So here we go. Haudenosaunee. Haudenosaunee. Right knee is better. I'm not, I'm not an expert. Um, uh, Haudenosaunee. Okay, and so these are the words uh, that contemporary Gaiakono people, most of them prefer that everybody use to refer to them. Because the words that are, were normally in circulation are sort of garbled, meaningless, and somewhat insulting. So Kayuga is actually just a really garbled translation of Gaiakono. Hodinasone uh, has usually been rendered uh, in words like Iroquois, which was uh, which was sort of trans, uh, you know, uh, non Hodinasone people talking to Frenchmen who wrote it down badly, and it actually means sort of duplicitous or untrustworthy. So, the Gaikono and the Hodinasone are not that keen on, on being called duplicitous and untrustworthy. So they say, "Call us what we want, uh, uh, what we want to call ourselves." And what's pretty remarkable is this is a very, very recent development at Cornell. It starts with, it started with, um, well, there's a Gaiakono reintroduction into the territories where they're trying to reestablish themselves at the north end of Cayuga Lake. They faced enormous opposition from local governments and local landowners. And there's a pretty significant governance crisis going on there between traditional people and uh, the group that's recognized by the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs. So it, it has been very difficult, uh, but that reestablishment only began in 2003, and it was really only around 2017 that uh, they, they got someone who was a first speaker of the language to come down and start teaching the language in the territory. And I don't think I had heard very many um, utterances in Gaiakono until around 2017, and then one of the things that they sat down with us at Cornell they said, teach everybody these words. So this is a really, really recent development. Uh, you know, if we'd been doing this 10 years ago, I, prob I don't think I would have been saying Iroquois, but I would have been saying Cayuga and not Gaiakono. So if we think about what these things mean, right, that there are deeper meanings to these words that the garbled translation uh, loses completely. So Hodinasone means people of the extended house. This is a sort of a cutaway view of what um, sort of the, after about 1350, became the very, very common form of dwelling across Haudenosaunee territory. This is a multi-family longhouse where you would have had a core group of related women, let's say a grandmother, her daughter, grandmother and her husband, her daughters and their husbands and children, the granddaughters and their husbands of children would have lived in this uh, in the same structure. A building of this size might have had about 30 people uh, that were all related uh, through the female line in that in that particular uh, in this particular dwelling. So this is definitely it's all an extended family of a sort. And so um, the Haudenosaunee means people of the extended house. That so means yeah, we live in log houses. But they also conceived of the Confederacy as being a giant metaphorical longhouse. So here you can see men with the distinctive headdresses of each of the six nations of the Confederacy. And they're sort of here, it says the, the Six Nations Confederacy was and is like into a longhouse. So they're conceiving of this whole landscape as being a place where one big extended family lives, okay? So we are in sort of the, the Gaiakono or the Cayuga compartment of the Longhouse, uh, but all of upstate New York, basically from Lake Erie to the Hudson River Valley, is part of that extended house. And certainly, you know, snaky, duplicitous people doesn't really do that, uh, do that justice. This is not the best map, but it'll give you a, a, a decent sense of where the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee nations were as of about 1720. Um, uh, I probably would have pushed the Senecas all the way out to Lake Erie, and the, and the Gaiakono definitely should be down into, down into Pennsylvania. 
Um, it's also, I think, pretty artificial to think about these things as being lines on a map, you know, where you could be like, I'm in Gayakono territory, I'm in uh, Onondawaka territory, that that's not the way it worked, that there were more sort of core areas of settlements and they were multi-use, uh, you know, sort of shared land agreements for other parts where you could come in and hunt and fish as long as you only took what you needed and uh, left enough for everybody else and things like that. So it's pretty artificial to render the, the borders in a, in a Western sense. Gaikono means from the swampy land, okay? So this is, uh, you know, I guess probably you all are a little less squeamish about squamps than, uh, than most uh, um, uh, people at, at Cornell or Ithaca. Uh, but it's not something we see uh, typically in the modern day as being an attractive place to sort of relate to. Uh, smelly, lots of insects, uh, and so, you know, you fill up your hip waders if you go in too far, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but this was definitely, I think, a, a real point of identity for local people around here. Uh, what's at the north end of Kiva Lake? Montezuma. What's Montezuma? Yeah, it's a swamp. Yep, it is. It's a national wildlife refuge. It's great for bird watching and everything. So uh, I think it's much reduced from what it would have been uh, you know, prior to uh, Euro-American uh, settlement, which is a euphemism for invasion. Um, and uh, but but also down here. In Ithaca, you can see in this, this is the first settler map that was made of the Ithaca area in 1790. And you can see they laid out lots of property so that they could sell it uh, to, to other settlers. Uh, but there are all kinds of swamp symbols for those of you that are used to topographic maps, uh, all in what's now the flats of Ithaca. And I think the reason that Ithaca has so much trouble flooding every spring is because the land is saying that you know, hey, we used to be a swamp, and we, we still think uh, you know we still think we are a swamp. Wegmans or no Wegmans, um, golf course or no golf course. So uh, so this we can really see this as being a point of pride. We can see that long term connection to this particular landscape, and the other names for the Haudenosaunee nations have real ties to very specific places as well. Now I know that you guys are going to be going all over the place, right? That uh, I think you know there are, there are, there are things in the Catskills, and then they climbing in the Shongoks. Is that is that still a thing these days? Um, and that some of the uh, some of the trails uh, cross between uh, the territories of different nations. So just to give you a sense of what's going on, um, uh, there's a major distinction between uh, the lifeways and really the histories of uh, two groups that spoke languages in different families, okay? So the green area here, uh, which includes uh, you know, quite a bit of the Catskills, the Shongunks, um, Long Island, New York City, you know, and points south and points east, these were speakers of Algonquian languages. And Algonquian folks tended to have a little bit smaller scale social organization, um, they, they would sort of have these small communities that were pretty independent from one another and governed themselves, uh, governed themselves independently. Uh, and there are all sorts of, you know, these sort of small units, uh, Esopus, uh, um, Shinnecock, there are a lot of different, uh, and you can see some of the other ones here, uh, throughout southern New England, New York, New Jersey, and, and to Point South. Um, these nations probably because they were not quite as organized and also because they were on the coasts, faced, uh, uh, they, they had a very hard time coping with the European invasion. So it happened earlier, uh, and their, I think their smaller status meant that they tended to get pushed out of the way by Europeans pretty quickly, and there are very, very few reservations left today in Algonquian territory. Most of these people, they, there are some that live in Ontario, some of them live in Oklahoma, um, Idaho. There's been an awful lot of displacement of the Algonquian people from the greater New York City and Hudson River uh, area. Uh, the Haudenosaunee, who we've been emphasizing and whose ter home territory we are in now, uh, were a little, they had a little more formal organization. Uh, there were uh, some of the Haudenosaunee villages had as many as 2,000 people living in them. 
Um, and then you had, in many instances, you had alliances of, of more than one of those villages, and they also had this big governmental structure called the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which allowed them, they had a lot more military power, and they were able to keep settlers out for quite a bit longer. Um, uh, as a consequence, many, but certainly not all, of the Haudenosaunee nations um, uh, um, have reservations in their home territory. The Gaikono are the one that doesn't. They don't have a formal reservation, and they haven't had any formally recognized uh, territory of their own in their traditional homeland since 1807. Um, so it's uh, the, the, the Gaikono, I think, probably have it worse among any of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the six nations. I should also mention that there are other members, so uh, that, you know, that there's a lot of autonomy among groups by the Algonquian folks, but not all of the Iroquoian-speaking peoples were allied with the Haudenosaunee. You had other groups known as the Susquehannock, the Erie, there's the Neutral, there's the Wendat, uh, who, were, who had, I, I think, similar ways of life, also lived in longhouses, uh, uh, subsisted on maize, beans, and squash, hunting, fishing, and gathering. Uh, but these guys, in, in historical times, were actually rivals of the Haudenosaunee. So it's not like these are two units. It's actually a, a much more complicated than that. Is this a terrible map? As you can see, they managed to put Cayuga in the entirely wrong place. It's the wrong lake, and they've got a nice O for Onondaga right where we are in Ithaca. A bad map. I should make a better one, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. So I would argue that when you are going on these trips, that it's worth your while to learn the history and learn the geography. There's a site called nativeland.ca, which is an indigenous-run organization. It's a work in progress, but they've attempted to um, uh, sort of figure out where traditional territories uh, were located. You can plug in town names or other features, uh, sort of like Google, and then it'll tell you which, uh, which, or which uh, nations consider that part of their traditional territory. It's definitely a work in progress. One of the things that, unless they've fixed it, uh, they would say that, uh, that Ithaca was Susquehannock ancestral territory, which I think is quite wrong. Uh, but it's, uh, but it's a good, stop, it's a good, uh, good resource, uh, ever evolving, and uh, they're definitely doing uh, the best thing that they can. So as I mentioned, contemporary nations may or may not occupy their traditional territories. It's certainly quite reduced, so this is uh, the official federal rec uh, federally recognized reservations in New York State today. Uh, you know, you can see they're all bright colors. Remember that in 1720, all of upstate New York would have been a bright color, and now you can see what's, what's left today. And this is, they say, Cuban nation status pending, and there's no colors there because uh, the, the territory that they own has not been uh, recognized as a reservation by the federal government. Um, and this, this is the uh, only Algonquian uh, reservation in, uh, uh, in, in New York State. So if you look back into the deep history, some of those groups have been confined, displaced, fused, split, and in some cases entirely wiped out. There is, for example, no current Erie community or no current Susquehannock uh, community. Uh, but, but I think it's not, uh, you know, a lot of people are just like, okay, we'll figure out what the traditional territories are and then they're done. But I think you have to, have to find out both the, the, the historical situation and the contemporary situation and try and figure out how things got from one to the other, okay? So it's not just enough to know that you're in Lenape uh, um, ancestral territory but you should know where the Lenape people are today, right? And sometimes it's not easy to, easy to figure out, but there are websites and, uh, um, you, you know, even Wikipedia, God forbid, can be a, a, a decent place uh, to start for that sort of information. So, you're probably like, great, I went to this lecture for DEI and the dude gave me homework. Um, so why? Why is it important to know this? As I've mentioned already about the Gaiacono, indigenous peoples maintain ties to their traditional territories even if they've been removed from them, okay? 
So the lands that you are going to be traversing, paddling through, climbing on, uh, are still considered to be the traditional territories. Uh, indigenous people will be like, yeah, that's, that's our land, okay? And I think, I think it's, worth, it's worth knowing that, right? So legal ownership in this particular sense doesn't matter at all, okay? That there's an ancestral tie there and it cannot be broken. The second, thing, second reason for all y'all uh, outdoors people to know is that the landscapes that you've been using, uh, that you are uh, making use of, have been used, nurtured, improved, and maintained by indigenous people for millennia, okay? So this is something like it's not just natural features with, uh, you know, some, some uh, trails that were blazed by a club in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, that you're really dealing with the long-term presence of humans. Um, it, and and I, think, I think it's useful to think about that. I think it'll change the way that you are looking at the woods and mountains and lakes and rivers around you as you do that. I think it's also important to remember that indigenous dis dispossession by pretty much anybody's definition except the legal one was unjust, okay? This is something where the United States, Canada, and other settler nations broke the laws in their own favor. Uh, they broke them with impunity uh, very, very often. So there were federal laws against states negotiating with indigenous groups to transfer land um, unless it was unless there was voluntary agreement by the people that uh, that were most affected. The you know the actual people who had say over those lands. Uh, and unless there was a federal representative there to represent uh, uh, the interests of Indian people. And New York State came in and uh, um, basically ignored all of those things, took uh, Guyacono land in a number of treaties between 1795 and 1807. No federal representative clearly, um, you know, you know they, they paid the Guyacono a certain amount and turned around and sold it to settlers for 15 times the amount they just shelled out. And there are Gayakona oral traditions about them arriving at the negotiations, and there was a table out in front with shot glasses filled with whiskey uh, um, uh, that they were like, go ahead, have some, right? And so uh, they were clearly trying to get Native people to do things that were not in their best interests, and they would use any tactic that, tactic that they possibly could. So the federal government, uh, the some Haudenosaunee nations, including the Gayakono, have sued New York State for breaking, for doing these things against federal law, and then it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court sort of said, "Yeah, it's true that New York State broke uh, broke the laws, but that was a really long time ago, and it would be very inconvenient for the people that are living in these areas for Native people to get any money or land back." So they basically said. Uh, you know, yes, there was wrong, but we're not going to give you any redress, not even a dollar. And um, uh, it, here, here's a real popular one. The, the, the decision that inst instigated that policy or originated that policy, it's called Latches, L-A-C-H-E-S, which basically said it was a long time ago and it would be too in inconvenient for us to do anything about it. Anybody know who wrote the Supreme Court opinion? Uh, that that stated that. Who? Was it, Justice, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg? It was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So uh, um, venerated in many circles, but her, uh, but, but not in indigenous ones. So um, it, it's it's uh, you know this is this is painful and unsettling history, and I guess it's worth you know it's worth remembering that you are traversing uh, uh, lands with a painful and un, uh, unjust, uh, unjust history. And I think another thing that, um, you know, I used to hike around uh, uh, when, I was, when I was younger, um, obviously not so much anymore. Keep it up, people. It's amazing how easy it is to turn into an old fat person, so watch out. Um, but, uh, you know, I didn't think very much about the, the distant history until I, you know, had an epiphany and became an archaeologist and, you know, whatever. Uh, but, but certainly parks and wild areas are socially constructed. They weren't always that way. And it's very important for you to know that it's not like there was this wilderness out there and, you know, now there's some trails and some, some nice hiking paths and everything like that. 
uh, so that there, there are all kinds of signs of prior human, uh, um, prior human occupation in the, even in the most remote wildernesses that you're going to be, uh, that you're going to be going across. A lot of them have to do with settlers, uh, but certainly if you look carefully and knew where to look, I don't know whether, I, I mean, maybe you would have to excavate to find the traces of indigenous folks out there, but they're certainly all over the place, right? And um, a lot of these parks, natural areas, things like that actually have a pretty weird history where there were people living there, but they were sort of bought out and forced out. So a lot of the local natural parks, there were small towns in them, uh, like Treman, uh, Villa, uh, uh, Treman State Park had a you know, small thriving community there. And then uh, during the Depression, they were bought out. All the houses were knocked down. And uh, uh, you know, to Gannick, you can see places where you, know, you can see like, the, front, the stone that was in front of somebody's front door. Um, uh, is still out there. So I think it's worth uh, thinking about the people that came there and even some settlers were kind of forced against their will uh, to give up the uh, to give up their uh, their lands. Most of what you'll see out there is uh, is farm walls, uh, stone walls that are between fields um, and you will find as you go through the Northeast that you will find stone walls in the weirdest locations. You'll find them in very, very isolated, on steep slopes, uh, you know, and, and you'll look at that and you'll be like, holy crap, people were farming here? And they were. So New York State, uh, right about the time of the Depression, there was almost no woodland left in New York State. All of it was being farmed, okay? So all, all of the wilderness that you're seeing now is actually has sort of grown back up. Some of it was kind of incentivized by the government through the parks process of creating national forests and things like that, but, uh, but, but it was really, you know, mo almost all of it was a human landscape. So you'll see walls like this in the middle of the woods. Uh, this is actually a LIDAR image, which is sort of a, a method of capturing the topography that's kind of, that uh, very cleverly, ingeniously, magically strips off the, uh, uh, the, uh, all the trees around it. So these are all the stone walls uh, that are um, uh, in a forest in Eastford, Connecticut, you can sort of see that they're all, all over the place, but that's a deep forest with really uh, clear-cut evidence of, uh, of Euro-American farming. So most of this is from settlers. This is after indigenous peoples were, were cut out. The reason that I say mostly farm traces is there's sort of an interesting set of ideas that people are talking about that, uh, that some of these may be indigenous and some of them may be places where settlers kept adding stones to indigenous features that had been there previously. Those wouldn't have been to divide farms. Uh, Native people in general did not put up fences and they, you know, stone is a pain in the ass, so they wouldn't have, you know, like if, you do, if you're not gonna put up a fence, you don't put up a stone fence, you put up a wooden one. Uh, but, but there are some ideas that there were uh, ritual enclosures, pathways, um, structures that were made by indigenous people out in the woods. So some of these, uh, and I think, you know, I think we really have to imagine them being a combination. Um, I get inquiries from people who are convinced that they have indigenous stone walls on their properties all the time, and I don't like it. It's, uh, so I usually just sort of say, well, there's this one guy who has this idea that there are combinations of indigenous and, and Euro-American features. Go talk to him and leave me alone. Um, so, uh, but, but it's an interesting idea, and I think it's worth, uh, it's worth considering. So, you two can't answer this, uh, um, Martin and Julia, but uh, how long have human beings inhabited the Kewa Lake region? Anybody? Yes? 20,000 years. Okay, not bad. Anyone else? Fault. Okay, anyone else? Anybody say like 400? You know, no, because usually uh, you guys are pretty close, right? Uh, I guess that's, that's good. Um, uh, I think we have evidence for 13,000 uh, in, uh, in this particular uh, region. So, uh, um, and in North America, the oldest convincing site is in White Sands, New Mexico. It was just published last year, 23,000 uh, years old. There are some old, older sites that are controversial. 
that's probably the one that people um, uh, rely on most these days. Before that, it was something but more like 14,000, so that, that discovery added almost 10,000 years to the known occupation, or the reliably known occupation of North America, and there was a, a, a Cornell-affiliated researcher who was part of that. It wasn't me, I wish it was. Um, okay, here's another one. When did permanent settlement of this area around Cuba Lake uh, by people of European descent first occur? So this is people who were here intending to use the land, stay year round, etc. Calendar year? Anything? Yeah. 1500. Okay. 1780. <laughs> <laughs> nice. 1820s. 1820s. Okay, so we've got a range. Anybody else? Okay. It's actually um, uh, 1780 is the closest. Uh, it's actually 1788. So, uh, um, and I think, did you do that because of the Sullivan, Sullivan Clinton expedition? Is that in where there's like signs in Aurora where it's like the first yes. white man like came here? Uh, yeah. That's why I did that. There's oh, okay. There's there are a few of those. Okay, well we'll, we'll get into it. But good job. I think, Thank I you. I think it was Sullivan or something. Uh, okay, so uh, so there was an invasion by an American army that burned out all of the Gaiacona villages that they could find in 1779, and a lot of people say that's when the Gaiacona left, but they came back then uh, too in about 1780, and uh, then the first white folks came in in about 1788. Um, uh, the first, first folks who came in were squatters. They actually had no, no uh, legal right to the property here by anybody's legal standards. Um, and they lived, I think, sort of cheek by jowl with indigenous people, not a ton of indigenous people, but enough indigenous people for probably 12 or 15 years after the American Revolution. Uh, before there was a little bit more heavy-handed effort to push indigenous folks out of this area. So that's a, you know, so Sullivan Clinton is definitely devastating, uh, but I think what people don't know and I think is really important is that there actually was a period of cohabitation for about 12 or 15 years between native people and the early settlers here, and they were apparently uh, exchanging things Native people were making uh, maple syrup, they were collecting furs, they were making baskets and trading with the early settlers. And so there's, you know, I think part of the reason that it's, you know, you need to know the exact historical mechanisms, but, they're at, but I think that that evidence for coexistence is actually really important because it suggests that this was not always a, a relationship of war, antagonism, bloodshed, right? And that's a, a, a message that I think is important to, uh, uh, to remember. So, if you make a pie chart with those two figures we just came up with, 1788 and 13,000, this is the part when this land was dominated by indigenous people, that's the part when it was dominated by um, uh, Euro-American people. Um, if you round up you get 1.8% uh, is Euro-American. And obviously that's what we see around here uh, because Euro-Americans are very heavy on the landscape. Uh, but, but I think, you know, this is, uh, I, think that, I think that's worth, uh, worth keeping in mind, especially when you're out in some less developed uh, areas. So there are definitely lots and lots of sites, indigenous sites. This is uh, something I did with a couple of collaborators in 2013. Uh, where we put all of the known archaeological sites in this region on a map. Uh, this is the stuff that we could find fairly easy and easily in published literature. There's a lot more site records uh, in Albany, Rochester, Buffalo, Binghamton, where, uh, where uh, various uh, museums have collected information. So there's def definitely more than that, uh, but there has been very little systematic survey that's taken place in central New York uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so this is a, a, a really, I think, a very dramatic underestimate of what, um, uh, of the total number of sites in, in this particular region. And just to give you an idea about how that change, how a survey can change things, uh, Dr. Mary Ann Levine, who I know was at Ithaca College in the late 90s, and she had a couple of summer projects where she took students out in the Trumansburg area and they got permission to go into plowed fields 
uh, from, uh, from the current landowners uh, to check and see if they could find evidence for archaeological sites. And basically, it was a plow field. Um, you could see artifacts on the surface if you were looking carefully enough. Uh, and they got access to 13 different fields, and they found indigenous sites in 12 of them. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, these were not huge sites. Uh, but they were, uh, but, but I think it's, it gives you an indication of exactly how dense uh, the indigenous occupation was. Uh, and these sites ranged over a period of almost 10,000 years. Uh, this is uh, what's known as an early archaic point that was, uh, uh, that, that dates, dates probably about 10,000 years, uh, um, 10 or 11,000 years ago. So it was, uh, you know, and I think you can imagine that if people did this all over the place, how much we would, how much more uh, site, more sites would be found. But there are also a lot of other things that out there that may not really be terribly recoverable archaeologically because they were kind of ephemeral to begin with or it was just wood or there were not a whole lot of artifacts deposited there. So uh, my colleague John Parmenter, who's in the history department, uh, wrote a, published a book in 2010 where he really talked about Haudenosaunee mobility, and he listed a lot of different things uh, that were out there for, uh, that facilitated movement. Um, and I think a lot of these things will look familiar to those of you who are hikers, right? Uh, that, that it's, if you think about like being on the Appalachian Trail, what's out there, a lot of these things, right? So there were trail systems, there were places where there were, fo where there were known fords, that were uh, very, uh, you, you know, that were crossable uh, um, in, in normal conditions. There were trail site sh uh, shelters. There were known places where there were springs uh, to get water. Uh, there were also forms of signage and other field communications. I don't know whether everything was blazed or not. I kind of doubt it. Uh, but there were ways that there, there were uh, symbols that people could put, uh, could write. Um, you know, with charcoal or what have you, that would give other people an indication of what was going on out there. Uh, indigenous peoples did draw maps, uh, very different than, uh, than Western maps. Uh, sometimes they would be drawn on bark or beaver skin or even plotted on the ground. Most of these were pretty temporary. It's not something that you would, uh, that you would carry around with you, but you might sketch something out to sort of tell, tell people about what they might expect on the trail or, or how close they were to Niagara Falls or something like that, and then you just get rid of it. There was a pretty well-developed uh, system of travel foods, parched cornmeal, which was dry, that you could, uh, you could moisten and, uh, and either eat it like that or possibly heat it. There were dried eel and other uh, forms of meat that you could take along on the trail. And what he, uh, his list here has all kinds of material culture that's related to being on the move. Moccasin snowshoes, pack baskets, cradle boards for carrying babies around, carrying frames for burdens, burden straps, work satchels, all kinds of things for carrying and moving around. Uh, uh, it it's also looks like there were set locations for crossing lakes uh, and canoes. Uh, definitely there were provisions for canoe storage. Um, uh, uh, it, oftentimes, if you read some of the textual accounts, you can see uh, uh, people, usually Europeans, who are along either accidentally or, or to observe Native people. They would go and they would, uh, they would canoe to one location, and then they would bury or hide their canoes so that they couldn't be found easily and hope that they would come back to them uh, later. So it wasn't like a you know, line bike or you know, everybody shares the canoes. Uh, but it was really people sort of saying, you know, like, I'm going to put my canoe here and hope that nobody else finds it. Um, and then, uh, although I think it's, it's harder to see, there were probably set campsites along lakes, rivers, and streams where there would have been a, a good places to, if you were canoeing, to pull over for the night. If we look at indigenous water travel, um, I, you know, obviously we've got some big ass lakes around here. And I think that most of those would have been pretty treacherous, um, especially uh, any of the Great Lakes, uh, to, if you were using these relatively small canoes. And I think there were some canoes for trade that might have uh, been able to fit, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 people in them, but those were pretty unusual. The standard ones were much, much smaller, so more, like, uh, more like this one that was sketched in the 1840s. Uh, so there was a real emphasis on using inland routes and smaller rivers, just because those were, 
you know, like if, if you ran into trouble, it was pretty easy to get to the side, and you, and you would have less, you'd be in less danger of drowning if it was a sudden storm or a flash flood or, or what have you. Uh, there was also uh, a, a real system of portages. Uh, so this is a really famous one. This was the route that many people used to get from Oswego to Albany, uh, and then if you felt like it, to get to New York City. So this is, you would travel up uh, the, uh, the Oswego River to Oneida Lake, go along the lake, go up Wood Creek, which is a, a, a tributary there, and then you'd have this brief place here, uh, the carrying place, where you'd have to uh, carry or drag your cargo and your canoes, and then you could get, uh, get into the Mohawk River and go downstream all the way to Albany. So, and then you would do the reverse on the way back. So there are obviously parts of those where you'd be going upstream for a really long time. Uh, but uh, but, but so you'd have to consider a seasonal water flow, all that sort of thing. Um, it looks like canoes were both, um, uh, I told you about sort of seasonal storage of canoes. There's a lot of instances in the, in the textual accounts by those Europeans who observed where they see people sort of saying, okay, we need to go to, Ni we, we need to, go to Niagara. Um, uh, and they said, okay, let's, let's build some canoes. And so they spent the next three or four days collecting materials, building canoes, and then they set out. So a lot of them were, were put, together, uh, put together pretty quickly. And then there's a cool thing. It does look like there were some people who were kind of dedicated canoeists. Um, and I'll, I'll, give, I'll show you a couple things about this. This is a map, a historic map, by a guy named, I think, Nicholas Bleeker, who was of Dutch descent, and he lived in Albany, but he was a fur trader and, uh, and also a cartographer. And Cornell owns the original of this document. It's pretty wild to uh, to uh, to look at. You guys will see it later in the later in the term. Uh, but this is I, I reoriented it so you can see. This is Cayuga Lake, so that's the north end of Cayuga Lake. There's Seneca Lake. That's the site where I excavated. Um, and uh, uh, that, but but um, so you can sort of see the orientation, but it's pretty hard to read things here. But in the next one, if you put it in its original orientation, there's a little place right here on the west side of, east side of Cuga Lake called the Tarry. Um, and so I was like, you know, what the heck is the Tarry? And then, uh, and then I remembered there was one of these accounts where Europeans were coming back from Seneca territory. They were probably right about here. And they were trying to catch the attention of someone with a canoe. And they had to, they would like build a build a big bonfire on the shore. They were firing their guns in the air, and I think that um, probably the guy Cornell people were not all that keen on having Europeans in their territory, so they made them wait, um, you know, for, for longer than they might have. Uh, but but I was telling one of my guy Cornell colleagues that that story, and he goes, you know, we have a song about waiting for the canoes. So, uh, you know, like an old song from this area from, you know, God knows how, old, how long ago. And so I was like, okay, that's what they meant there, that there were, there were these set places. And I think, um, you know, presumably uh, the canoeists would respond to their kinsmen a little bit more quickly than they would to a, a missionary who was uh, coming in and trying to establish a mission and, and Christianize uh, the population. But you can sort of see how the infrastructure worked. I'm going to give you a couple of instances of um, maps that were made. Europeans asked Native people to record their spatial knowledge, okay? This will just give you uh, a sense of what people knew about. And the way that this was written, the way that the connections were made, um, they're obviously not done in a Cartesian sense, but a lot of the distances here sort of reflect how long it took to get from one place to another. So in this particular map, I think this is Albany down here, okay? And uh, they've got, uh, they, they have that route uh, where you go to get to the, um, uh, there, there's a night of lake, is that sort of sausage at the, at the top there? So this is actually that same route uh, that I just showed, showed to you on that, on that other map. Um, and then this is, darn it, 
I get so confused about this. Um, but there's, there is Niagara Falls on this, and I, you know, it's like it's hard to see. I'm sorry, I should have been better prepared for this part, but the, they, they have, it goes all the way from Albany to Niagara Falls, and it's very much written in the way uh, that, that this person knew that, uh, knew all of these routes as an, eye, as an eyewitness rather than just it just being hearsay. So this is from around 1696, uh, when the British were still kind of, and the, and the Dutch people that were still here were sort of confined to the Albany or Schenectady area. This one is from the 1790s, so this is actually during that brief period of coexistence. Uh, and here, uh, the, a map was drawn. Uh, there, it says something here, it says, an intelligent Indian drew this map, which is, you know, I think really, sort of a backhanded compliment if I ever heard of one. Uh, but this, um, uh, you can see up there, uh, you can see Oswego. If you keep going down here, there's a, a Rondequat Bay. Here's Niagara Falls. And it, this, is, uh, this is Lake Erie. And, uh, uh, and, and so uh, if you go here, this is Kiva Lake um, uh, that connects up with Oswego. And if you go way down here, this is Fort Pitt. So this is somebody who knew the area from Pittsburgh all, uh, to Niagara Falls uh, to uh, all the way to, um, uh, to Oswego and, and a whole lot of other streams and watercourses that, uh, that, that aren't represented there. And this is even after uh, indigenous people have been confined to reservations. So there's just mobility on a scale that we really, uh, that, that, that I think is kind of mind boggling for people who didn't have cars and airplanes. So I'm just going to say a little bit more here that, you know, really we're dealing with cumulative layers of mobility and landscape modification over 13,000 years. I don't think I'm going to get into this. It's a little bit too, uh, um, too uh, uh, involved. But maybe a couple of things to show, to show here are, are how the drainages work in Haudenosaunee territory. All of the areas that are shaded in blue, this is a beautiful hand-colored map that I made about 20 years ago. I'm very proud of myself. All of these blue areas uh, drain into Lake Ontario and out through the St. Lawrence into the Atlantic. All the red areas drain down the Hudson River and go into Long Island Sound in the Atlantic area there. Some of you may have seen those signs on the highways where it says you're entering the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And you know, when I first saw that, I was like, what do you mean? The house is but all, all of the uh, yellow lands here drain through the Susquehanna River and go down to Chesapeake Bay, which is sort of Maryland, Virginia, D.C. vicinity. And the green area uh, goes into the Ohio River, which eventually drains into the Mississippi. So you can see how geographically advantageously placed the Longhouse was because you had access to all, you had connections to all of these different parts of the, uh, of the continent that you could get to uh, you know, reasonably easy with, easily with canoe travel. What this uh, sort of satellite image shows, I think, is you can sort of see the value of the Lake Ontario Plain there, and that there was, uh, you know, that there, the transit really in that, in that much smoother area that the glaciers really uh, bulldozed a, a lot of things out of the way. You can see how that was a major east-west uh, corridor for transportation, and in fact, Settlers, of course, put the Erie Canal in exactly the same, uh, the same location. I'm not going to do that. There, see, I did have too much stuff. <laughs> um, and I know I'm just about out of time. So once again, I wanted to remind you of the locations of the present day communities uh, that are tied to all of these, uh, these uh, landscape, uh, uh, you know, the, the traditional territories that, that we're talking about here today. And then I wanted to just give you a couple of examples of the importance of mobility to those contemporary uh, communities. Uh, there's a, 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 a treaty that was made between the Dutch and the Mohawks in, in 1613. Um, it's in some ways controversial, but not to Haudenosaunee people. They were like, yeah, it happened. And this is what it meant. Uh, but it was, it, it's called the Two-Row Wampum Treaty, and it has to do with how cultures interact with each other. And the metaphor is that Native people are traveling in a canoe, 
and Europeans are traveling in a ship. They're both on the river of life together, but you're not supposed to reach into the other vessel and steer them. You have your own laws, you have your own spiritual ways, you have your own customs, and you're not supposed to mess with each other. And so this was a recipe for coexistence between the settlers and indigenous peoples. And um, uh, the Haudenosaunee still say that this is very important, and this is the way that settlers and Haudenosaunee people should be dealing with one another. And then, of course, the US and Canada are just like, no. You're, um, you're going to an English-only school. You're going to have an, English na uh, an American name. You're going to wear American clothes. Uh, we, you're, we're going to punish you for speaking your language. And there have been lots, and we're going to take all your land. Uh, there, there are lots of violations of this, but it's still very important. On the 400th anniversary of the treaty, uh, they actually had a flotilla that went all the way, I think, from Lake Ontario all the way down to New York City. Uh, where they were, uh, the, these are the native canoes on the, on the River of Life, and when they got to New York City, this was a representative from the Netherlands who came for the, um, for the renewal uh, of the, uh, that's a Turo wampum uh, uh, made out of shell beads, and there are all the people uh, that, uh, both native and, uh, and allied people, who went on that particular, um, uh, went on that particular journey. I remember thinking about going, and I was like, that would be cool, and then I'd be like, no, it wouldn't be cool, and now I'm kicking myself, I really should have done that, that would have been amazing. And maybe a little bit uh, more about the value of, uh, of pedestrian uh, transit, uh, and again, this is about treaties, there's a lot that's about treaties, because there are some where the U.S. committed to things, and treaties are in the Constitution are supposed to be the supreme law of the land, um, the Jay Treaty of 1794 said that native people, they, uh, they had imposed, the European powers had imposed an international boundary between Canada and the United States on these traditional territories. And the Jay Treaty, uh, the Haudenosaunee obtained the right from uh, the British Crown in Canada and the United States government that they had the right to free passage across the international border. There could be no taxes. They could, you know, they, they couldn't be obstructed, and so this is a celebration of that right, uh, which continues to be recognized by the United States. The Canadians don't agree uh, agree to it in the other direction, but this is an assertion of those rights for free passage, and this is uh, something that happens uh, in Niagara Falls uh, every year. So. That mobility, uh, both by water and by foot, was still incredibly valued uh, by uh, indigenous folks. And I had about like a million different examples of sort of patterns of mobility over uh, 13,000 years, which I'm going to spare you uh, tonight, uh, especially because the weather's really great. And I can't believe that I kept you indoors here for an hour already. So, um, uh, so thank you very much. Um, I guess uh, I certainly should release anybody who wants to be released, but I can hang around and, uh, and answer some questions or hear some comments uh, if anybody wants to stay. Yes. If anyone has any questions, raise your hand. All right. Okay, cool. If you need to go, please feel free to excuse yourself. Particularly since, you know, it would be nice if I could sort of say, okay, Gaiacono's Gaiacono, and you know, go visit their museum, you know, uh, um, you know, buy ice cream at their store or something like that. But because the conflict is so real um, and violent, I mean, this is one of the worst. We are right in the middle of one of the worst governance disputes 
uh, anywhere in the country right now. Um, and I think people don't know about that, uh, but I, I think it's pretty hard for you to sort of say, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people uh, take action on, on uh, behalf of the traditional folks, but I don't think that you should be in a position where you sort of say, do this, right? I actually, as a Cornell faculty member, I can't tell you to do anything one way or the other. Um, uh, so, so those are, are very fraught, I think, sorts of decisions. I think that people have to educate themselves and maybe travel around and figure out what they think the best thing is to do. Um, you know, like, uh, and you know, I, I'm also very hesitant that a lot of times the solution that is proposed is to give money. And you know, that's certainly important, but I don't think we want to, let's say, have um, the landing acknowledgement just be associated with people, you know, waving their tin cup and hoping to get donations. I think that's totally the wrong thing to do as well. So as far as what to do, I don't think that I can give you many recommendations other than to educate yourself and try and figure out what the best way to do, what the best thing to do is uh, given uh, what you learn. So I wish there was an easier answer. It would make my life much easier, but there isn't. So, so I hope that's useful anyway. Thank you. I have, I have two questions. Could you talk a little bit about the power dispute with um, that's going on right now and what the two different parties represent and what they want. And also, um, I'm curious about any thoughts you have on the naming of Gnendigo Hall. I'm not sure if I said that right. And, um, and what Cornell should do as an entity for um, restitution for displaced Native American populations. Yep. Yep. Okay. Dang, you guys don't ask easy questions. Um, so to briefly describe the, the governance dispute, um, there is a traditional government of chiefs and clan mothers that has existed for, um, let's say, at least 500, maybe one or 2,000 years, uh, where they govern by consensus, and um, uh, there are certain very prescribed roles of leadership. Um, just to give you an example, the Gaikono have 10 We'll call them chiefs. The real word is hodianeso. Um, and decisions have to be made by consensus by all 10. There's nobody at the top, right? And all 10 of those chiefs have clan mothers that advise them. And they can't, they can't make a decision if the clan mothers don't also agree as well. So the, gover the governance structure, I think, is it's very ponderous. It takes a long time to make any sort of decision. Uh, but, but that's the way that they worked out traditionally to, uh, to govern themselves. Uh, the United States obviously doesn't like that. They were, they, 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 you know, like they were like, who do I have to call, right? You know, they want one person at the apex. They want the CEO. They want the president. They want the, the, uh, the, the chairman of the board, what have you, right? So uh, the U.S. has basically tried to get, uh, or in some cases, force new structures of government governance on indigenous uh, places. Uh, that operate much more on a, a Western model. And so what happened in uh, the Gaiacono case is there was one person who uh, had a fairly minor role in the traditional government and sort of the traditional say that he overstepped his boundaries, that he's doing things and making decisions on his own that he has no right to do. And they say that they stri stripped him of his title. Uh, but he argues that he does have this role and he's had votes among the community of people who, uh, Guy Kono people, who live in New York State or who relocated to the north end of the lake, and they have supported him and his council. And basically what he is trying to do is he's using capitalistic forms of um, raising money in order to create a land base and create uh, um, a financially durable way for his people to exist in modernity. So, uh, and some of it involves things like, um, uh, like gaming, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 gambling um, uh, of various types that the traditional folks are opposed to. 
And he's also created a court system, a police force. They have any number of businesses, and they're making a lot of money. They are very successful in that particular way. So the traditional people say that's illegitimate, but uh, I think if you sort of did a pros and cons, I don't think the traditional people have really figured out a way to make themselves a thriving community in modern times, which does involve money in some ways or another. So uh, th that's really, I think, where it is. Uh, the traditional people are much more interested in language and customs, uh, and there's been violence between the groups, particularly the BIA-recognized government, uh, bulldozed like a, a teaching facility, a daycare center, and a whole bunch of businesses that were at the time being uh, being operated by the traditionals uh, in 2020, and there, uh, and and I would say the traditional faction really hasn't recovered since then. So uh, it, it depends what you value. It depends what you think is the right way forward. Is it something where you're going to have to operate inside the U.S. economy, or is there a way to do something differently? Um, and uh, and I think it's uh, you know I think those are both valid ways of uh, going about things, but it's um, it's uh, um, you, you know I think it, you, you have to think about your own values and what, what you think is important, and uh, to hear the arguments of the people that are actually involved in it. So. I think that's all I'm going to say there. Second part of the question, Ganetigo Hall was actually uh, uh, proposed, well, Cornell said we, we, need, we would like to have an indigenous theme name for, the, uh, for one of the new residence halls on North Campus. Most of them are named for famous alumni, right? Uh, 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 you know, like Toni Morrison, uh, uh, et cetera. And unfortunately, we have not had a prominent Gayakono alumni of the same stature, which is really, I think, a, a failure of, uh, of Cornell's uh, um, uh, leadership in, in terms of education. So um, uh, my program asked some of our uh, Gayakono allies what, the, what an appropriate name would be. And one of the people said that he had in his family uh, the, the name for the Ithaca area which is Ganetigo, it means either on a hill or in a hill. Um, and it had been preserved in his family and taken to Ontario, kept there for over 200 years, and they, want, and they said, that's what you should call it. That's, that's our name for that place. So I think that that's actually, you know, that's actually a community um, uh, suggestion. It's in, it was endorsed by leadership uh, in, the, in the community, and uh, so I think that that's actually great. It's got the, you know, it's in the original language. It has the proper diacritical marks. Ganetigo is, is how you say it. Ganet, so like eh in the middle, and gong, with almost with a little bit of a shade of an end at the end, uh, at the end of the word. So everybody, Ganetigo. Ganetigo. All right. Um, and so, is that enough? Is it enough to name a building, right? Or do does Cornell owe? the guy Kono, uh, the other Hodinosane people, and the people that were affected by the Morrill Act, um, we, we've tallied it up in my program, and there are over 240 indigenous nations, contemporary indigenous nations, who Cornell has messed with their lands in one way or another over the course of history. Is it enough just to have a name on a residence hall? Uh, uh, my, I don't think so. Uh, the faculty in my program don't think so, indigenous people don't think so, but the administration has been relatively slow to move to do anything more comprehensive than that. So, okay, tough questions. Thank you so much. Anything else? Something you talked about was the need to further educate ourselves on these issues, which I think is a really good point. And I'm curious if you have any recommended resources to learn more about the um, uh, traditional people in the area. Yes, I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> there. So I decided well, I was on the fence as to whether I was going to get a good uh, It's in the Cornell so. store. Is, are, there still, are there still more in the store? Yes. Okay. <laughs> And I think it was six seventy five in the store, so it's not you know it's short. It's written for a popular audience in the at least insofar as a career academic can write for a popular audience. Uh, but but uh, it's about eighty pages. 
and it has a lot more detail about some of the things that I was talking about today, including the governance crisis. So um, I tried to summarize that to the best of my ability. So, um, and if you can't get it there, there is the History Center, uh, which is the local historical society on the commons. You can get it in person there or on their, in, through their online bookshop. Uh, it's, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't, it's, it seems really cheesy for me to uh, uh, do that for, uh, for my own work, but, uh, but, but it was something that I really didn't feel, like I felt like I had to write it, because there wasn't anything uh, that, that covered things in, uh, in the same, in this sort of the long arc, you know, this goes from, um, you know, from the, uh, the last ice age to things that were going on last summer, so, and, and there wasn't anything that did that. So that's what I would recommend as a starting point. To go beyond that, uh, just send me an email and I'll see what see what I can recommend. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. We yep. really appreciate it. And I'll I'll I'll, um, I'll I'll give you your payment for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> QR code if anybody didn't get it, um, it needs to check it.